the manure that we generate is is so important to our operation. That is our fertilizer, and that has uh, kind of driven our uh, expansion with with farms and so forth. Because once we have uh, that crop ground, we need fertilizer, and there's none better than our natural, you know, uh, 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 pig manure. And and so not only uh, do we use that, but usually we generate enough to sell to our neighboring farmers. And so that has generated some um, some revenue for us a- as well. And, and I mean, it's a win-win for everyone. Swat it. Hello, and welcome to our newest edition of Swat It. Uh, I'm Jerry Purvis, your host. And today we are lucky to have uh, Jay Moore, who is the Director of Environmental Services for New Fashion Court. Uh, Jay, uh, good to have you today. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here and appreciate the time with you, Jerry. Jay, uh, I guess to start, let's just uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your uh, yourself and how you got to where you are today and, and through your career. Uh, you, you bet. I, uh, yeah, again, appreciate the time. So yeah, I've done many different things in my career. You know, been on the public side, you know, as a um, um, regulator, and then um, actually entered the. Um, and, and then I, I taught um, uh, in higher ed for about uh, eight to nine years. Coached college football there, so uh, you know that was a, a good time. But um, I received a master's uh, degree in environmental health science from the University of Oklahoma dealing with all aspects of pollution. So I went back to East Central University in Ada, Oklahoma, and taught there and, and coached football for a number of years. And then um, uh, from there, um, you know, I kind of jumped around in, uh, in the public sector. And then I took a position with Seaboard Farms as their air quality coordinator. So doing odor research for uh, the pork industry. So from there, um, I was contacted by New Fashion Pork and Took a job with, uh, took this position with them back in 03. So I've been here, you know, over 20 years with uh, New Fashion Pork and uh, the fracking family, Brad and Meg Fracking, the owners. And um, anyway, it's been a rewarding ca- career, C- certainly never boring. And and um, so, uh, you know, that's kind of kind of where we're at. We have a time and labor saving product for you. AgriSlats by Healthy Farms is your solution. No more lugging jugs around the barn every month. With AgriSlats, you simply drop the slat through the floor twice a year and it works to break down solids, reduces crusting and forming. To learn more, visit MyHealthyFarms.com. Well, it seems you've had a, a plethora of experiences and, uh, you know, uh, environmental, when we think of, uh, when I think of my experiences, uh, you know, there was a person that, that worked with the, the regulatory but uh, looking at some of the things you you've accomplished, you have really taken that to a different level beyond just you know just regulation. Yeah, uh, Jerry. I mean, certainly permitting and interfacing with the regulatory community is a, a primary role. But um, then we oversee all the nutrient managers and working with our farmers, and of course we have a farming division, and um, and then we have our own construction crew. So um, it was kind of imperative that you had a guy to to uh, connect with all those uh, operations. So we're all on the same page. So, um, yeah, it, it's, um, like I say, wearing many different hats, but they're all related to the environmental um, efforts. And so it's uh, it's a good fit. And, uh, you know, like I say, it's been uh, quite rewarding over the years. Yeah, uh, usually you think of that department maybe as a call center, just kind of like a feed mill would be a call center. But uh, you have taken it and actually added some value uh, with some of the things. I want to just talk a little bit about, uh, particularly, you know, you mentioned your nutrient management program. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So as I uh, indicated, we have a farming division. And uh, so the manure that we generate is is so important to our operation. That is our fertilizer. And that has uh, kind of driven our uh, expansion with with farms and so forth because once we have uh, that crop ground we need fertilizer and there's none better than our natural you know uh, 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 pig manure and and so not only 
uh, do we use that? But usually we generate enough to sell to our neighboring farmers. And so that has generated some um, some revenue for us a- as well. And, and I mean, it's a win-win for everyone. We're certainly not trying to get rich off our neighboring farmers. We we need those guys and we have long-term relationships. So it's just a, a, a great fit for everyone. Yep. Yeah, it was something you, you were doing and we discussed earlier, uh, and maybe just let the audience know how much you're actually able to uh, actually grow a, a, a good percentage of the crops that are used uh, in your system. What? Tell us a little bit about that. What percentage, you know, are you able to? Yeah. Um, so, so we own our own feed mills, and so all the corn, soybeans, you know, that they're um, uh, you know trucked to our, our feed mills, and so we're probably producing twenty to twenty two percent of our um, crop needs, and so you know certainly um, uh, significant, and certainly helps us on our bottom line, but. Uh, that has been a great attribute uh, to our success. So, um, uh, and, and like I say, we work with our area farmers, and and, and so we um, have opportunities to to uh, buy their corn as well. So, you know, it's all about relationships. So it's, uh, yeah. So, so you've uh, so you're working with local farmers. Uh, you're you're controlling, just, you know, like I said, 20, 22 percent of, of the grain that that's, that's being consumed at your at your feed mills. Um, and now you and you mentioned uh, that you actually are selling some of that manure. So how how are you able to you know have excess uh, nutrients available? So so we um, our, our farming operation it, it's state of the art. We, we refer to it as zone tillage and a strip till. But we're laying down that strip of manure every six in every sixteen inches, um, and it's GPS. And so, in the spring after after fall applications in, in the spring, we'll come back and plant that that uh, kernel of corn right where we laid that manure down. And so, therefore, we are fertilizing that field with less fertilizer, less manure, and therefore we have manure uh, to. Uh, share with our um, with our neighbors, and so yeah, we um, we just you know try to capture fifty percent of the nutrient value for the N and the P. We don't even uh, charge for the K. And um, a- anyway, uh, it's it's been a good program for everyone. So uh, you know, by that um, state of the art farming, the the strip tiller, the zone tillage, um, uh, and and strategically using that manure, uh, we we have we're doing more with less. You know, so. Yep. Now, how are you able to, uh, we've had some groups out here in our way that uh, have been able to kind of manage the the differences within that field and, and apply. Is that some of the things that you're doing? You, you, you bet. Uh, uh, in other words, you've got a field with some light oil in the hilltops or so forth. And so, in other words, that the, our technology will will show that it's um, the nutrient values are less in those particular areas and in its adjustable rate. So yeah, that's a big part of it. So like I say, it's uh, it's amazing what we're able to do now with uh, with our farming technique. So um, you know, moving moving forward and as I say, with all these environmental issues, carbon sequestration, agriculture is the solution. It's not the problem. So. Exactly. You know, that's, it, it's almost like uh, environmentally, a lot of times the manure is, is, a, is a waste stream. But you've actually taken the value of it and added value to your, to your business. Uh, and that's amazing. It, it is a commodity. And like I say, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be as near as successful as we are with, without our uh, manure. So we, I mean, we treat that as a product because it is <laughs> highly valued. That's one of my biggest, uh, uh, challenges is to try to keep everybody happy I mean, those farmers that um, use it they want it and it's usually not enough to go around so yep yep that's kind of here you know a lot of guys uh with with dairy you know they'll they'll get litter you know from some of the poultry houses and uh and it's but uh but yeah it's it's uh and we'll, we'll have hay and that's kind of how we recycle it but uh you know it, it's uh, a lot of times the public doesn't realize we're uh, we're a lot better uh, users of our resources than they than they realize. 
we are the stewards of the land. We are the environmental stewards. So, you know, um, you have your environmental activists, but we live here. Our families live here. We're going to protect exactly. our land. And, uh, yeah, we, wanna, we want to um, uh, produce and create our livelihood, but there's not a lot of land, and we got to take care of it for the next generation, and we do. So. Exactly. Now, some of the other projects uh, I wanted you to mention uh, I thought really interesting, uh, particularly some work you did at Seaboard with Odor. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, uh, of course, you know, when, when you come to, uh, when you enter the swine industry, the, the odor issue has always been huge. And we know a hog stinks. It'll always stink. I mean, you know, cattle stink. You know, sheep certainly do. Uh, poultry, I mean, they all have, it's livestock. You know, it's inevitable. So, um, but yeah, at Seaboard, I looked at multiple um, um, uh, products and, you know, tried to establish, you know, good uh, protocol. But uh, as you and I uh, discussed earlier, uh, general good housekeeping reduces so much odor, you know, just in itself. I mean, you know yourself, you clean your house and keep it squared away. It's, you know, heck of a lot nicer to live in and, and uh, uh uh, anyway, it's just uh, common sense there. But as I as I uh, moved forward, um, you know, we, um, I mean, olfactometry or the odor or odor science uh, is such a um, an evasive science. I mean, you um, you certainly you have um, ways to measure it and so forth, but it's. Um, uh, you know, very subjective. Um, and so, you know, anyone can declare themselves, I'm an odor expert. I mean, that's how how um, loose it is. But um, uh, we have uh, moved forward, you know, using the nasal ranger and the centometer in certain, you know, Colorado, Wyoming, they have um, uh, air programs or air quality programs that you have to meet. And so, um, again, good housekeeping. But as um, uh, when I uh, moved to New Fashion, had a long-term relationship with John Baumgartner out of Olivia, Minnesota. And uh, John has um, worked diligently in the environmental field for livestock and, uh, and uh, uh, producers. And so he had um, purchased a patent from the USDA, and it's electrostatic precipitation. And so basically what that means, you're going to force a, an electrical charge on a dust particle and then capture that dust particle. So thus, by removing the dust particle, you're going to impact and reduce the odors that, that are generated. So we worked together. Um, we actually had an individual, and we don't have many issues, but we had one individual that, that uh, sued us uh, at a national level, at a state level, and in all situations, we received summary judgments and basically threw the um, case out. But during that time, we always want to try to be good neighbors. So John and I scratched our heads, and we had been working with this technology, and we had it inside the barn. It worked, but it wasn't user-friendly, so we brought it outside. We put up a curtain um, across where the exhaust fans of our tunnel barns would um, uh, emit um, uh the um the airflow and so we placed this curtain across you know it's um 110 feet long uh, 11 feet tall so it's basically act as a filter and so then we uh pulled some strands of bob wire creating the corona points and so it would emit these electrons in the space so if you walked in there and walked under this bob wire fence it would feel like a the hot wire fence, you know, your hair would raise up. If you grabbed it, it'd shock you. But um, anyway, it was emit emitting uh, uh, trillions of these electrons. And so it was collecting dust. And it was significant. And it was uh, so good that other producers uh, down in Iowa was wanting to uh, duplicate that. We said, sure, you know, uh, we don't have a patent on it. And it created a whole new industry. So the um, it's an EPI Air, and it's based in Columbia, Missouri now. So I, I know other producers in Iowa are using that, and I say it's um, aesthetically uh, uh, pleasing, and it is significant. Iowa State has performed research on it, and it shows a 50% reduction of odor with the EPI air curtain, plus uh, planting um, 
uh, trees, you know, out, you know, 150 yards from the building or so. So yeah, that's, uh, that's been um, an area where I'm really proud of and working with John uh, Bob Gardner and give him the credit for his innovative thinking. But um, anyway, it was a, a great time. And, and like I said, we uh, went beyond the call of duty to help our neighbors, even though it didn't help them. They were still <laughs> angry with us, but you can't fault us for not trying. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I think you had a good point there that, uh, you know, we as producers, we're, we're stewards and we want to be good neighbors and, and we don't want to uh, pollute the environment. We live here. Many of these people lived on these farms for years and want to continue future generations. So uh, most producers are not willfully trying to uh, negatively impact the environment, you know, and uh, great innovation. You know, that was a great innovation. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I think odor, don't you think odor is, is, is one of the, the key reasons or pushback to uh, swine. Uh, sure. It, it, uh, Jerry, it is. And, you know, if we could have that silver bullet to knock odor out, certainly there's going to be somebody complaining uh, about something. But uh, I think you would um, uh, satisfy a lot of people with, if they knew they didn't have to have that smell. But we're in the country. we got to make a living. And anytime you generate a product, whether you're in the city or country, you're going to generate some waste and, and more than likely odor. So, you know, when people move out to the rural area that think, oh, I'm going to breathe the fresh country air. Well, there's people trying to make a living and it's tough out there. It, it's tough, you know. And so we try to do everything we can, raising hogs, cattle, you know, uh, crop farming. Um, you know, that, that's one thing about the farm community. Uh, there's a lot, and especially our, our younger generation, they're innovative and they're willing to try something. And, and certainly when you're doing that, you try to make it better. So um, anyway, just uh, uh, kudos to our producers and our, and our farmers. Um, uh, I, I think, like, like I always say, good people find each other. In the pork industry, I have, um, I, I believe that to to the way I die, there are great people there, long-term relationships, and um, we share the information. We're on the cutting edge so many times of, of improving uh, our industry, and I think we set a standard for everyone. So, yeah. You know, it seems like uh, here, and it's probably your area too, uh, that it's the encroachment. Uh, you know, there are more people moving into rural areas uh, that maybe weren't, uh, didn't have any concept of farming and what farming just like you know they go to the grocery store have no idea of how that how that product got to that meat case uh yeah yeah i mean and if we were negligent in an area that's where it is jerry that because the farmer keeps his head down you know, bust his butt and uh you know, basically independent, don't want everybody messing with him, but we have got to educate our neighbors. And I think we're doing a better job of it now, but that's where we have fallen short. I was in Washington, D.C., and this was his educated attorney talking. He goes, I don't understand why you guys, you know, do what you do. And we just get our meat from the grocery store. This was a grown man and still at that concept. I just... I had, to, I had to walk away, you know. So, yeah, but um, yeah, I think you know fewer. It seemed like you know, probably our parents, grandparents, everybody had a few animals, you know, on the farm and raised their own uh, food, uh, and so everybody kind of had an aspect, you know, a perception of farming and and was acceptable to farming. And farmers were, you know, uh, farming was a was a highly thought of profession. So, well, um, I, I I think it still is, but we are. Today we were so removed from from that family farm. I know Ron Prestich, you know, past president of the of the National uh, Pork Producers Council. He always had an effort. He wanted every university at the freshman level to have a Ag 101 class teaching students where our our, our products come from. And I think that's a, a great idea, and it's it's needed, but. Um, yeah, it, it's a uh, it's really really frustrating when um, 
you know, I'm, I'm standing there and I'm in, in a town in, in Colorado and this dairy odor is just um, coming in the town and they're going, man, those pigs stink. I just shook my head. You know? <laughs> but, um, but anyway, e- education is so important um, to our industry now. And I think um, uh, most state chapters with our, our national um, uh National Pork Producer Council are doing a great job trying to get our message out, but you know we can't do enough in that area, and it needs to go into our um, our schools, you know, where where the kids you know truly know. So yeah, you know, I had, I had to share a story. I, my daughter had a book. Uh, it was a uh, it might have been a, a economics, but uh, they, the only thing they had in there about farming, they have a picture of a spiel. You know, and, and so, you know, if you're a kid that doesn't know anything about farming, that's your, that's what they're going to tell you about farming is that we're, we're polluters. <laughs> well, that, that's their vision. And so I mean, those are far and few between, especially this day and time, because if you don't take care of your business, I mean, you're out of business. I mean, that's yeah, as exactly. simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, things happen. I mean, uh, uh, no one's perfect. We've had our issues. I mean, not many, but we, but we have. But what's important, you can't control everything, but it's how you respond and how you communicate. And and um, so uh, this day and time, uh, I think the, the pork producers, as far as interfacing with the regulatory communities, they, they do a great job. Not that we agree on everything, not that we're going to have battles and, and disputes, but when it comes to if this is a law, we're going to comply. You know, yep, hundred percent agree. Very good. Now, you also just changing uh, directions a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your carbon sequestration, and uh, maybe define that. Some of these, maybe some of our listeners not really understand what that's all about. Well, uh, and it goes back whether you believe in, you know, they used to call it global warming. Now it's climate change. So, yep. whether whether you believe in that or not. It's here to stay. I think the genie is out of the bottle, and I think there is opportunity for folks to get scientific grants and, um, and then possibly uh, sell carbon credits. So, so carbon sequestration again connected with with uh, global warming, and they're always pointing the finger at agriculture as as the you know major uh, problem. So. So we um, have have looked at this uh, for the last three or four years, and so there is an effort to move forward, but no one has the standards or the protocol to define what a carbon credit is. And not only that, but once you establish what a carbon credit is, you know, is it if you do X number of things, is it a, a credit per acre or you know, per pound, anyway, it's just, it's the wild west, west out there right now. But even after we have a, a, a firm established, established protocol, we'll have to have um, a method of verification. So those are the two big hurdles that we're dealing with to develop this carbon trading. So, um, you know, you have a lot of the uh, Bear, uh, Cargill, all these big producers that have programs established and will pay farmers 10 bucks an acre, 40 bucks, whatever. Um, but we have uh, uh, connected with uh, Pipestone, who has developed a uh, organization called Greenstone. And basically, it is a farmer co-op to try to tackle this issue. And so the farmers will invest $1 per acre. So if you had a you know, hundred acres, and you wanted to be a part and try to sell carbon credit. You give them, give them a hundred bucks, and so that money is going towards research and establishing a protocol and a verification. But basically, trying to get a seat at the table with all the um, big companies and and the government entities to to try to be there to um, you know create that that protocol. And so by doing this, the farmers saying, you know, we don't want that. 10 bucks. Well, we're the solution to, to, you know, carbon sequestration. You know, the, the Midwest uh, corn crop uh, is a sink for, for uh, um, 
carbon dioxide tenfold uh, uh, compared to the rainforest, you know. So, so, um, um, so anyway, this Greenstone is an opportunity for farmers to come together, be at the table, and get more money for a carbon credit than what's being offered now. So I think if we get enough farmers together, like like, like you say, I mean, we are we are the the, the first level of defense, if you will. And so I think it's huge that I think government entities will listen to the farmers and, and um, anyway, to, to be a player in the decision-making. Um, because, I, I again, I think we're the solution. And the, the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle that I see with carbon sequestration is we receive no benefit for our manure that's being used as a natural fertilizer, recycling, our, our, our waste. We've been preaching recycling since the late 1940s, and we're doing exactly what um, what we should be doing with that. And so we've got to get credit for the use of our um, uh, natural fertilizer, our manure, our nutrient values there. So that, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Like I say, it's kind of a wild west right now. I think big companies are looking internally to try to get insets uh, establish how they can reduce their pledges and, and so forth and before they start buying carbon credits so so we're we certainly haven't given up but it's it's a slow process and like i say um everyone is trying to figure out the, the best pathway to establish those um that opportunity to sell carbon credits yeah, I think you make a good point. You know, we are we are pretty good recyclers of, uh, and, and as you said, you know that field of corn there is is a, a, a sinkhole for for it carbon. Is. Yeah, so it's uh, we have an opportunity, and, and we don't get the credit probably for what we do for for the environment and preventing some of these uh, no these greenhouse yeah. gases. Oh so, yeah, yeah. So, and you know, I like to say, I I, I think. With our best management practices and 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 just being dedicated, I mean, I think we can prove that that we're um, more help than a hindrance. You know, exactly. You know, one uh, one thing we had talked earlier, which I think is is uh, we talk about resources and uh, but in uh, something that I think all of us can uh, can can do is in is water conservation, and and that's probably going to be a resource. Going forward with more and more people drawing and and uh, in areas, and that's going to be a limited resource. Uh, can you tell us a little something about that? What you've been yeah. able to do? Yeah, you, you know, and, and it is. It is. I mean, water is the element of life, and uh, we see water shortages uh, shortages out in the out in the west. So we have operations in in Wyoming, and so um, one way that we looked at our operation there's other factors for us to pursue this but we decided to become a closed loop system out there because we were in the okalala aquifer and it and heavy irrigation and so in laramie county where cheyenne is located you know they have a strict control over water usage our farm was in kind of the conservation area next to it but by doing this closed loop system where we're uh and we've got lagoons out there so we're recycling the the lagoon water and flushing our pits i mean we have reduced our water usage dramatically and we're kind of a star program for the you know state engineer's office and the uh, uh DEQ out there um so you know like i said uh before we were probably using because of the system we were taking it to the uh, center pivot we were probably using a hundred a uh, hundred million gallons of water a year okay so so now we're using about 26 million gallons you know uh, wow that is so, an awesome yeah. reduction yeah but then in our deep pits in Minnesota and in um, Indiana I mean you know Indiana too we're we're in seven different states. But um, uh, it's it's so important for water management uh, at these sites because our deep pitted barns is where we store our our uh, nutrients, our our manure, and that, uh, as I said, is a great commodity. And so we don't want to dilute that at, at all. And so 
but but plus, um, you know, it's important to conserve water. And so we have specific targets for, you know, our uh, for our finishers, for our nurseries, for our uh, shell farms, for our boar studs, and so and then we monitor it weekly, you know, for water conservation. And um, so I mean, if we see um, if we see you go beyond your tar- target, you know, one or two weeks, it, we have notifies our service staff, and they drill down and to find out what the heck's going on. So, so uh, water conservation is huge. So, well, it looks like you know we always say you you can't improve something you don't uh, you know you don't measure something it's hard to manage it. Oh but, yeah. Uh, so yeah. You, you sound like you're really man you're really measuring some of these things. But what are some of as you got into uh, what were some of the things that maybe we could take home maybe producers today what are some of the things that you found is that were going on that you were able to improve that led to such a drastic reduction uh in your usage yeah yeah um well and and one thing is you know we take water samples we look at the water quality and so health is, is huge and so a lot of our areas were heavy and and metals, you know, manganese and magnesium certainly causing scours and so forth. And so, um, and so, you know, we would set up a system where if we had access to real water, we would bring that in. Plus we have uh, our well. And so we would use the, when, when the young pig would come in, the, the winglings would come in like a wing to finish or, or our nurseries, we would use um, the real water until they got old enough where they could um, handle the, water quality uh, of, of the well water. Um, so, but, but one thing, just best management practices, we always see issues if, you know, let's say a, uh, a site is, is um, loading out animals and you have an empty room. They've been, our, our staff is required to go in there daily and, and check that empty room. And that's where, problems occur because no one goes in there and especially winter time you know you might have a frozen pipe and all of a sudden you you fill a pit up in the middle of winter and you got an issue there you know so it gets cold it gets cold in uh, minnesota and northern iowa so um you know just simple things like that and um and then we you know uh sample the water routinely and and our, our veterinarians um want to see that and and so water quality is connected to to our herd health and so you know it's just extremely important so you know those are just some of the common sense basic things that we implement you know mainly is just take ownership of the farm and and understand your water system understand your feed system and uh and and of course um we have good staff, and uh, but you can never have a, enough good people, and so you know it's always it's always a challenge, and it's a uh, always a learning process. Very good. Well, so you've got a lot of different uh, made some impacts you know, in a lot of different areas, and uh, I didn't want to uh, end this before uh, mentioning uh, that you were uh, maybe you can tell a little something about you were named the environmental steward. For Minnesota, is that correct? Yeah, yeah that, 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 that is I correct. I know you're very, very humble, but uh, that's an awesome accomplishment. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, um, we have been involved um, with the with the pork industry at the national level and and with our state levels, and so um, I've um, been the past president of the Minnesota Pork Producers, and it just shows you, you know, the the sign of the time, you know, that the environmental guy is is um, head of the Minnesota Pork uh, Producers Association. But, yes, I, I was nominated and then uh, selected as the environmental steward uh, for uh, 2023. So um, we usually have our Pork Congress in Minnesota in February. So um, I will be receiving that award, which it's always good to be recognized by your peers. But I, I tell you, um, my reward is has uh, allowed me to have the, the passion and to work with good people, and it's just an honor to be in this industry, and and it's uh, certainly appreciated. But um, wasn't necessary, but you know, um, uh, I'm not gonna. Um, I'll accept it uh, uh, humbly and with uh, gratitude. So anyway, um, yeah, yeah, appreciate. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. Congratulations. That, that's a, that's an awesome uh, accomplishment. And uh, 
and and duly noted, you know, for all your accomplishments. But you know, I sit here thinking, we're, and our time's drawing nigh. But uh, we had uh, you are. This is an awesome model for what we need to do, you know, going forward, and what producers need to uh, embrace if we are to be sustainable. And 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 you know, the public's always is is more, uh, we've gotten more scrutiny than we ever have. And uh, but it's you know what you've done is just an awesome model for how we can be better stewards of our resources, and uh, at the same time, we, you know, we're in a business. We're in you know to make money, but we're also in a business to to leave this 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 earth, this part of earth, you know, better than when we maybe we had it. We started farming, so yeah it, it's 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 an awesome uh, uh accomplishment and uh, uh like i said it's just a i think it's a it's a model for the future yep. what other producers should do and well, uh, well you you have my information if any producer wants to seek me out and throw things around man i'm i'm excited to do so you know and, and like i say we do a lot of uh, other stuff with our manure you we use products you know uh, we use a lot of DCD to tie up the, the nitrogen for stability, um, which enhances the manure. So there's a, a lot of other things that, that you can do that we really hadn't drilled down on. So uh, like I say, if somebody wants to understand more about our nutrient management program, we'll you know, just fire away and, and uh, contact me. So That's a good – you know, I think we've, we probably, uh, in your career, we probably just touched on the – the surface of all the things well, that you've probably done that we, that we haven't even mentioned today. Yeah. You but, know. yeah. Well, let me jump in here. Now, um, one thing, especially in the environmental field, I mean, everybody, you know, production wise, they want to, you know, keep their, you know, their genetics and trade, uh, you know, uh, top secret, but in the environmental field, you know, maybe the old adage, misery loves company, but, but we share, <laughs> we share everything. And so, uh, so a, a lot of things that we've implemented, we glean from other people. So we're all in this together. So like I say, if I can help somebody out, well, man, I, I'd love to do so. Yeah, I love that about the industry. You know, we all share and it, nobody's got secrets. We all have, you know, uh, things that we that they don't want us to share. But as far as technologies and, and uh, anything that we can make, if I can find a better way to, to do something, then that helps all of us, and we all benefit from from that collaboration. And it's a small. We talked about it too. It's a small. Uh, our industry is smaller than it seems. You you can know somebody, and usually you you know somebody that knows somebody, and it, it's just a matter of picking up the phone and, and giving a call. And everybody is really uh, easy and and willing to help when you have an issue. So. If, if you don't, if you don't, if you got a problem, it's because you hadn't, and you don't have a solution. You hadn't talked to the right person. That's right. Yeah. Again, again, good, fe- good people find each other. Yep. That's exactly right. Exactly right. It's time for our famous three. Meet AccuFast, your trusted partner in raising efficient, healthy, and sustainable pork. We're not just about genetics, we're about tailored solutions that set you on your path to success, no matter how you define it. At AccuFast, we channel our investments into three crucial pillars, our genetic offering, proprietary technology platform, and leading commercial measurement system, ensuring tangible results for our partners. Visit our website at AccuFastSwine.com or reach out to an AccuFast customer success rep to discuss how we can help you create the future you've been working towards. AccuFast. The best way to predict the future is to create it. Well, we're, we come to end, and uh, we always like to ask three questions. And uh, so, you have three. The three questions. The first one is: What would be would, would you say is your favorite resource? Um, book, or and it doesn't have to be about uh, environmental or whatever. Yeah. Um, well. I'll just be honest. This it's a old holy Bible, man. That's that's the book to live by. So try to read that as much as I can. But uh, you know, uh, 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 professionally, uh, you know, I'm I'm an old guy, and so man, I I like phone calls, you know, and I do text and emails, but I'll pick, I'll pick up the phone, and I I like um, you know, I'll call our state office. I've talked to them this morning, you know, about some issues, but. Um, you know, my, my resources are my personal relationships. Yeah. 
Yep, exactly. Like I said, we you're only one call away from from talking to somebody that. Uh, and sometimes it's just an you know they encourage us. We all need encouragement, you know, uh, when something's going not as well, and and then you talk to somebody that is having a similar had a similar experience. So it's all yeah, exactly. Um, secondly, what would be well, who would be your most influential person? I guess or persons uh, on your career. Oh man, there's been there's been a lot of a lot of people. Of course, you know, playing college football and so forth, coaches. But um, I used to train running horses too, and I had a fellow named Lewis Warchow, and man, he was the greatest boss, and he just uh, really taught me how to get the most out of people. And he was one of the kindest individuals ever. But um, with that being said, uh, Rod Frecking, the owner of New Fashion, one of the smartest guys I've been around, and just um, his willingness to treat everyone at New Fashion as family. It's just been an honor to work for him this past 20 years. And so um, so anyway, and, and of course, um, uh Lastly, but not leastly, my mom, toughest individual I ever knew. She grew up in the Oklahoma cotton patches, and uh, you know, uh, she did an excellent job with with her family. So, you know, I've um, appreciated um, being her son all these years. So, very good, and, and so true. You know, our our family, you know, it is our. Uh, that's when we develop a lot of these these uh characteristics that we go on you know that that put us on a path you know for, for the rest of our lives so uh very true uh i guess last what, what were some of the what would you say are some characteristics of successful people um and we could call you you know what are some of your characteristics or things that uh that you see that are are similar in, in successful people in our industry being competent being honest and being a visionary, you know, I think those those three characteristics I always look for, you know, as far as a leader, um, you know, that, uh, you know, just knowing how to do things, being honest, telling the truth, and then then having that entrepreneurial spirit or that that vision of where you want to take the company, where you want to take your employees, yeah. And that means that doesn't always mean success. That means failure a lot of times. But um, anyway, it's uh, if you're not, if you've never failed, you're not in the game, you know. So yeah. exactly. Well, you know, in your career, I can see where you have really uh, every day. It seems you wake up and try to find a better way or to do things, and and, and you continually improve it. Never, never get to where you. You're you're resting on your laurels, and that, that, that you know it all, and that this is as good as we can do. You just keep living every day to try to get a little better. You can all, even an old guy can always learn something every day. A, a good a good day for me is not receiving any calls, but making some calls. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we we uh, when we think we know it all, um, we're headed for a downfall. We we definitely. Uh, I, I learned. It seems, uh, and we can learn from anybody, even the guy, the guy out there working in the barn. Uh, sometimes you learn as much from him as uh, about our problems and how to fix them by just talking to him. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Every, every day they can tell you how to fix a problem. Yeah, you know, never underestimate anyone, and be and be kind to that waitress. You know <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, very good. Well, Jay, this has been a great conversation, and uh, I know I've learned a lot of things. I know the audience, and uh, but uh, it's just uh, I just really appreciate you know what you've done, and 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 what you've done is not only improving your business, but it's helping others, and it's helping our industry. Well, as I, a whole. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. But Jerry, I just want to say I appreciate you all your efforts with these podcasts. They they mean a lot, you know, and uh, and so like I say. Um, uh, if if you want to give my name out to anybody, man, uh, feel free to do so. Okay. Very good. Well, very good. Well, I appreciate it, Jay, and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Okay. Take care, my friend. Right. Take care. Bye bye.